Welcome into the latest episode of the Unpaid Interns. Austin Render joined by Tamar Share here on Monday, August 31st. Hard to believe we will be flipping into the month of September tomorrow. But what a what a great month it has been of sports tomorrow. It, it has been uh, exciting, uh, wall to wall month of sports. But before we get into the sports going on, um, huge news this morning in the college basketball world. A couple days ago, we lost Lute Olson, uh, Arizona, former Arizona basketball coach, one of the all-time greats. And this morning, tomorrow, we we got news that we lost another all-time great in John Thompson. John Thompson passed last night, you're right, at age 78. And not only was he a Naismith Hall of Fame inductee, but he also broke barriers in the college basketball world. He was the first African-American to take a team to a national championship. Now he was the Georgetown head coach and he was widely recognized for the action he took part in social justice. And of course, he's very proud of all that is going on today, that all the players are standing up, sticking up for this social justice fight still. Um, And most particularly, he was walked out of a Big East game because of how, how against Prop 48 he was. So that was like a big feat that he was able to contribute and stand up for what he believed in. He was very against racism, of course. And so that we are losing a legend in John Thompson. He's been recognized extensively on Sports Center all morning. And just he is an incredible person that uh, will be missed in the sports community, the college basketball community. You're right. Absolutely. He made an impact much larger than just Georgetown. Uh, like you said, a college basketball legend. Uh, prayers and thoughts are with his family and, and those around the Thompsons. Uh, let's get to uh, some of the news in the sports world. Um, tomorrow, the Big Ten is just kind of it feels like the Big Ten is almost walking backward a little bit and trying to backtrack without being too obvious that they are backtracking. I don't know, but first you get the report that it looks like they're going to start in January and try and look at a dome set up like a Lucas oil stadium. And then you hear that they might actually want to start Thanksgiving week. And, and now you're there's, there's reports and, and they're from accounts on Twitter that I don't know if they're verified, if they're trustworthy accounts, but there's some accounts tweeting out that like these presidents are starting to think maybe the sooner we start the better. Uh, Where, where does the big 10 stand right now in terms of trying to get a college football season going? I really don't think they'll be able to tell until college football really starts in other places. And it was really quick of Kevin Warren to say, you know what, big 10, we're canceling football or canceling everything. And I mean, I don't think that we can say if that was a right or wrong decision until college football really kicks off. And of course, they are starting to. And now that everyone's back on Mm -hmm. campus and we're now starting to see, but until they really get in a rhythm, now we're just in the first week back. So until they can really see where it goes, I think Thanksgiving is kind of a good date to say this is a landmark or time stamp that we want to put out to say if it works maybe there can be a season, but it just doesn't make sense all that much right now going the back and forth. It's very confusing. And of course, Nebraska is still at the big 10 right now and very frustrated. The parents are very frustrated, of course, because no one's following in suit, but you never know until it really kicks off and it hasn't yet. I I think I talked about this before we ended up uh, scratching the Friday episode, but I just, Thanksgiving doesn't work, I don't think, because if you do Thanksgiving, and let's say that the the SEC, the ACC, all the all the conferences that are starting here in September, let's say it's successful for them. So by the time Thanksgiving rolls around, they're in the latter stages of their season. The college football playoffs coming up at the beginning of January, and then the Big Ten is just in this awkward middle ground where they're just the laughing stock because, look. Our, our thing worked. We're going to go play for a national championship and the big tens thing might work, but what are they going to play for a big 10 championship? And that's it. I mean, Ohio state, Nebraska, 
Penn State, these are teams that don't want just a Big Ten championship. They want to play for all the marbles. And I, I just I think if you're going to play, you got to do it with everyone else. And if you're not going to play, then you need to wait until everyone else can play again. And I, I just think Big Ten is in this really awkward middle ground where they are not going to have an easy solution. So. And to that extent, too, it's putting a lot of pressure on the bodies of the players. So mm-hmm. if you're saying having the expectation of starting Thanksgiving, you're that you're taking a toll on the players. And for what? In the sense that what you're saying of if they only can compete for the Big Ten title, is that worth it to them to put their bodies through that much for a very, very short and weird season? I think that's part of the protest from like Nebraska players and and, and families, because It's not only these guys want to play, it's that I think they're realizing with everything that the Big Ten has done, if the Big Ten plays in January, if the Big Ten plays in November, whenever it may be, they're likely either playing by themselves or with the Pac-12, and that's it. And nobody wants that. They want to be able to compete for the big title. So I'm very curious to see if things slowly get walked back. The teams are all still practicing, so... I mean, you could theoretically go at the end of September if the Big Ten really turns around and goes back to what they had originally planned. But we'll see. I don't think that's going to happen. And I think the Big Ten could, if this works, be the laughing stock of college football. But but we'll see. There's still always that possibility of that second outbreak in September, October, November that we just don't know about yet. Uh, let's get to our uh, our guests here. We have a double guest show today. We haven't done that in a while, but we have a couple of makeup guests from last week's technical issues. First, we have from the Washington Post, the soccer beat writer Steve Goff is joining us. Steve, how are you today? Let's see if we can get him unmuted. There you go. Hey. Hey, how are you? Good. Happy to have you. Um, appreciate you joining the show here. Yep, my pleasure. Um, Let's let's talk uh, since you're big soccer. We're, we're bringing you on to talk some soccer. Let's yep. let's talk about the big event that happened during this whole pandemic here in, in the soccer landscape. That's the MLS is back tournament just finished up a bit ago. How great was it to see that live soccer back in the States and kind of get that taste of, of normalcy in a way of what used to be uh, in the MLS? Yeah, no, I think it was certainly something um, MLS uh, wanted to do. They felt they needed to do it. Uh, the players obviously were eager to get back. The fans wanted to see it. Um, and they did it in, a, in a, a safe way after a rough start. Um, you know, a couple teams were uh, red carded, uh, for uh, lack of a better term here, um, because of an outbreak. And... Uh, you know, they brought that with them from their hometowns and, and that caused an initial scare. Uh, there were a couple games suspended, postponed. Um, so there were some concerns at the start of the tournament, but they ironed it out. There were very few in- health scares beyond that. Uh, the tournament went off pretty well. Um, you know, it's, uh, it got them, you know, back in the conversation of sports. Um, you know, with baseball about to restart, the NBA and the NHL about to begin their playoffs, MLS needed to do something to remain uh, relevant during these crazy times, and, and they did it. And now they're back in uh, home markets and, and resuming their regular season um, without fans in most stadiums. You've, co- you've Go covered- ahead, Jamar. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. You've covered DC United since their inaugural season in 96. You've yeah. worked for the Post since you joined part time as a sophomore in 85, is what Austin put out. <laughs> How has the Post changed since you joined? Uh, I mean, all media has changed. Um, you know, it, the, the days of a uh, of, of city newspapers, of newspapers in general of a handful of national magazines, national TV networks being the only source of of information um, are are long gone. Obviously the the, the landscape has changed immensely with the rise of the internet um, and the Post has had to compete with that. Um, You know, the Washington Post, the New York Times, uh, the LA Times, Wall Street Journal are still 
you know, very prominent newspapers, but, um, you know, people get their information from many places, um, you know, whether it's uh, Twitter or Facebook or, or blogs or websites or the, um, you know, the explosion of, of various TV um, outlets, uh, streaming video, uh, you know, it's just a whole different world. And, um, you know, we're, as a, a, a legacy media outlet, um, we're, we're being challenged and we've been challenged. And um, uh, most newspapers have struggled through it. The Post has done pretty well, certainly helps to have uh, the wealthiest man on the planet own the Post. Um, so, um, you know, challenges, uh, challenges are, are behind us and in front of us. And, um, you know, we're doing the best we can under uh, uh, challenging circumstances. You, you're kind of the model uh, journalist for staying and succeeding in one place for a very long period <laughs> of time. That, that, that yeah. It feels like that's hard to come by nowadays, yeah. but what's your advice to, to the younger journalists trying to get their foot in the door, trying to kind of get some traction in what is such a competitive feel? What's your advice on how to kind of get started and, and cement yourself. Yeah, it's hard. Um, it's much harder now than it was. Uh, you know, it's, you got to really, really love it because, um, you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna become a millionaire doing this. Uh, you're not going to have a typical uh, work week. You're going to work nights. You're going to work weekends. You got to really love it. Um, you're gonna, you're probably going to struggle. It's, it's hard. It's, you look at what's going on in the media, uh, massive layoffs, cutbacks, uh, streamlining of operations, closure of, of newspapers, of websites. Um, it's, a, it's a very difficult time. It's, a, you know, it's an exciting time. And if you're, you're very passionate about it and you're talented, you, you can make it and you will make it. Um, but it's not for everyone. It's... Uh, it's something you should really give a lot of thought to, whether that's the avenue you want to pursue. Um, it's, a, it's a tough time. I don't know if I were coming up now, knowing what I know, um, you know, I don't know if I would go this, the route that I took, which was, you know, going newspapers and writing and, and strictly uh, pure forms of journalism. Um, I would look to, you know, work for um, a professional league to work for, uh, you know, sports marketing to be, you know, if you really love sports and you really love communication, then you might look to, um, you know, whether it's uh, public relations or promotions or video production, social media um, work. There's, there's a lot of different jobs now. There aren't as many um, in, in uh, the, the most traditional forms of journalism, but they're you know, there are a lot of opportunities in, in different kinds of communication. And of course, when you were starting out, who would have thought that we'd be in the position we are in today where there was a lack of sports for quite some time and we've all experienced it in one way or the other, but you specifically, how were you able to continue to put out important stories and relatable stories in a time when there were just no sports going on and there was a lack of that energy. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it's been an extraordinary year and not, and not in a good way. Um, you know, during the time between, you know, uh, late March and uh, June, July, um, you know, a lot of us in the sports department uh, split our time between uh, keeping an eye on sports because there's still things going on and helping out on the news desk. And that meant, um, you know, some people out in the field reporting on the impact of the pandemic. It meant people like me uh, helping out with the, the live uh, blog um, that was created for the coronavirus, you know, um, whether it was reaching out to the Bureau of Prisons to see how the coronavirus is, were affecting prisoners or it was chasing down a story in, um, you know, Oregon about a small town that was hit hard. Um, you know, there was, there was just so much news to cover and there was a demand for it because people, you know, people were confused and they were scared and they wanted more information, they wanted more news. Um, and so 
Uh, many of us in sports shifted over, uh, worked on the news side. Now we're back into the sports realm. Everything's, uh, everything's going on. Certainly a dif different atmosphere, different climate. Um, you know, the role of a sports reporter has changed too. I mean, we just don't have much of any access to athletes these days because of the, the health situation. Um, so the days of going into a locker room um, or hanging out on the side of a field uh, after practice, those days are gone for the foreseeable future. And um, I imagine even when things return to normal, we're not going to have the same sort of access that we did um, pre-pandemic. Yeah, let's uh, let's talk a little soccer while you while we have you here. I mean, you've covered quite a quite a bit of action in the World Cups. Um, I mean, here in the U.S., I'd say they probably hit a low point there in 2018, or they did not qualify. Um, yeah. What what are they doing here? What have you seen them doing in the past couple of years to try and set themselves up for a more promising 2022? Yeah, and their national team's definitely um, in a period of transition. There are a lot of good young players, um, particularly based with European clubs, that are rising with the national team. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of promise and hope here. Um, you see Christian Pulisic with Chelsea, and now Weston McKenney with Juventus. Tim Weah is back playing in France. You got Tyler Adams with Leipzig. Um, you know, they were a, a semifinalist. Um, in the in the Champions League, you got Josh Josh Sar Sargent starting for uh, Werder Bremen in Germany. Um, uh, you know, Fulham has uh, up to the Premier League now, um, and you know they they have Tim Ream who's who's coming back now. Anthony Robinson uh, has moved up from the second division up and signed with Fulham. Uh, so some good young American talent out there, and it's up to Greg Berhalter coach to make it all work. Um, certainly they'll go into World Cup qualifying starting next summer as one of the favorites as they always are. But you know, there's still that cloud hanging over this team for failing to qualify for 2018. Uh, though they will rely on some veteran players, but this is a younger group and it's largely untested um, in major international competition. So um, you know, still some questions out there for this group, but um, a lot of positive signs. I mean, Giovanni Reina um, is now a regular at age uh, 17 for Borussia Dortmund. Um, and, uh, you know, the players are there, the talent's there. Uh, Greg Berhalter has to make it work. And he's uh, got till ne next summer um, with limited opportunities because of the pandemic to get these guys together, play some games have a couple of training camps and uh you know make a run at the the 22 world cup well it feels like christian pulisic is is the most known of all those young guys it feels like he's getting a lot of respect with his post quarantine play with chelsea is he the type of guy that could swoop in and kind of give him like a landon donovan type feel where he just kind of takes the team and, and becomes the savior of u.s soccer yeah, I mean, um, he is. He, there's a lot of similarities to Donovan in the sense that his attacking skills are uh, much more refined than you know most American players. He takes on defenders. Um, he can create and he can finish. Uh, the difference is is that Pulisic is now doing it at high levels in Europe, whereas Donovan most of his career was spent. Um, in MLS. Still had a great national team career, but Pulisic is doing this at a young age um, in the top leagues, you know, first in the Bundesliga, now in the Premier League. And as we saw this summer um, with Chelsea, he was, he was fantastic. He, he was uh, one of their top players uh, after the Premier League returned. Um, you know, it was uh, heartbreaking to see him get hurt in the FA Cup final at Wembley. Um, he's out for a while. He'll be back, but certainly a, a key player. Um, and because of his experience with the national team going back uh, four years, uh, he's the centerpiece of this uh, effort to qualify for the World Cup, no doubt about it. Steve, you've covered a lot of soccer and a lot of World Cups at that. Do you have any crazy or funny stories from your time covering the sport <laughs> or DC in particular? Uh, 
Man, that's a tough one. It's a good I'm sure he does. We're putting him on the spot here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry for that. Yeah, no, that's all right. There's some good ones. Uh, let's see. Well, for national teams, I mean, World Cup qualifiers are always an adventure, no matter where you go. Um, whether it's, uh, you know, going to Costa Rica and, you know, not having any power outlets for your laptop and, you know, there's there's some outlets behind a, a locked door and we're trying to jam open the door with anything we could so we could power up our laptops before the batteries died. Um, Azteca Stadium in Mexico City, uh, you know, when you're part of the media at these World Cup qualifiers, you're in the crowd, essentially. There's no press boxes or anything. Um, and in Mexico City, when Mexico scores, there are beer showers. And so when Mexico scores, you're popping open your umbrellas to protect, you know, the back of your head and your laptop from getting damaged. It's just the, you know, it's just the way it is. Um, you know, going to Honduras, you know, the last time there was in a, at a very dangerous time uh, because of gangs and cartels, you know, we weren't allowed to leave the hotel. So these are things that you deal with covering soccer, um, international soccer that you don't deal with uh, when you're covering, you know, Big Ten football, you know, it's just a different world. Um, as far as World Cups, uh, you know, it's, a, it's always an adventure. I mean, uh, uh, you know, driving around South Africa uh, was an eye-opening experience. Um, being in China and Japan for various events are, are, you know, life experiences that you do not um, you did not have uh, during the course of uh, your writing career in, in the United States. So, you know, soccer provides a, a, a window to the world that, you know, other sports do not. Even the Olympics, the Olympics are very, uh, you know, very regimented, you, you know, um, you're in a, a press village or you're in a stadium and you're, you know, you, you just don't have the same experience that you do with soccer when you're among the people, when you're in smaller cities, when you're traveling, um, you know, getting to live in Moscow for six weeks in 2018 for the World Cup was something I never thought I'd do. And uh, here I was, you know, I just rented an apartment in Moscow, you know, and uh, something a little, a little bit different for sure. And you speak to, of course, the international experience that you've been yeah. able to have in abroad and the fan bases in particular in those cities are way different from looking at soccer in the U.S. Can you speak to any of those experiences that you've had and how there's a huge difference between abroad soccer fans or football fans and then yeah. here in the U.S.? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think sports in general, I mean, you go overseas and you understand that like sports in the U S are largely based on geography. You know, um, if you're from New York, you live in New York, you know, you follow a local team, the Yankees or the, the Knicks or the giants or whomever, um, you know, overseas, there's certainly that geography, but there's also other aspects. It can be political. It can be religious. Um, you know, going back uh, generations, uh, Celtic versus Rangers in, in, uh, in Glasgow, Scotland. You know, if you're, if you're Catholic, you support Celtic. If you're Protestant, you support Rangers. Um, there are many instances of, of uh, places where, you know, working class people in a city support a team and one team and uh, the, the higher income people support another team. So you're talking about socioeconomic issues um, uh, influence who you support as a fan. Um, you know, the closest thing I would say to the in the U.S. to overseas in which fans are tribal um, is college sports. Um, you know, if you're uh, an Indiana University fan, basketball fan, growing up at a young age, it doesn't matter where you live in the country, you're always going to be um, an Indiana fan. That's, it, it's in your blood, it runs probably through your family. Um, you're never gonna give that up, even if you're, uh, you know, even if you're living in Los Angeles or something. Uh, you know, soccer, it's the same way, uh, you know, where 
if you're a Manchester United supporter, you're always going to be a Manchester United supporter. That will never, ever change no matter where you live. Um, so, yeah, no, it's just, it's, it's different. The intensity of the fandom there is far more than here. I mean, we talk about, you know, the Red Sox Yankees rivalry or Michigan, Ohio State, um, North Carolina, Duke, things like that. But at the end of the day, everyone's still friends. Overseas, uh, if it's Barcelona and Real Madrid, they're not friends. This carries well beyond, well beyond sports. Uh, Boca Juniors in River Plate in Buenos Aires. You know, there is a divide there that will never be conquered. Um, so yeah, no, it's just a, it's a different world and it, and it transcends merely, you know, uh, sport and, and geograph geographic alliances, I think. Well, we'll let you go on this tomorrow and I both cover college soccer here at IU. And it feels like this is a really talented time for college soccer. A lot of talented guys are at least coming through for one, one season in the college ranks. How important do you feel college soccer is for the United States soccer landscape? You see a lot of these guys go to the MLS how do, you, how do you think it's kind of grown the, the importance of collegiate soccer? It has its place. Um, frankly, college soccer's influence has waned as younger players have more opportunities to go professional at a, at a younger age. So you see players with um, connections to MLS academies signing when they're 16, 17, 18 years old. They don't go to college at all. Some will go overseas and enter uh, youth academies. So, um, you know, the, the, the level of, or the depth of talent in college soccer is not what it used to be because players are leaving early. And I mean, you could say the same thing about college basketball mm -hmm. where, you know, players just aren't spending, the, the, top, the top players aren't spending as much time with college programs. It's the same thing with soccer. Um, you know, there will always be a place for college soccer, for, you know, for 99% of the players who don't have a realistic chance of playing professional um, or making a career out of the sport um, after college, you know, college soccer makes perfect sense. Um, you're a good player. You're going to represent your university. Uh, you know, you have a scholarship. Um, it, it, it's perfectly good. But it, those elite players are spending less and less time in college soccer um, or they're skipping it all together. Um, you know, you're, you're seeing it more and more with these academy players um, who might commit to a college and then decide over the summer before they enroll, you know what, I got an opportunity to sign a professional contract for some decent money. This is my future. Um, I'm, I'm just not going to go to go play college soccer. Uh, in general, it's still very competitive. Um, whether it's Indiana or Maryland or Virginia or, you know, last year, Georgetown, um, there, there is a place for, uh, for young soccer players um, in the college ranks. But, you know, World Cup players coming out of college, not so much anymore. It's just those days, I think, are past. Well, Steve, we really appreciate you giving us some of your time here. Sorry it yeah. didn't work last Monday with the <laughs> Zoom outage, but uh, we appreciate you being flexible and a uh, really good insight into the world of soccer and journalism yeah. itself. So take care. Thanks so much for joining us. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. See you, Steve. Bye -bye. That was Steve Goff of the Washington Post, the soccer beat writer, joining us there tomorrow. Really fun conversation with a guy who's been a lot of different places. You heard him with the – World Cup qualifying and, and World Cups in general. That guy has traveled the world and it's always cool to talk to people like that. I feel like we've mentioned a little bit about the abroad fandom of football or soccer mm -hmm. is what we say here in the States, but it was cool to see his perspective of actually being there for his entire career and being able to go back and forth and see many different places and really how both that is really ingrained in society. So he was talking about the religious aspect and just how it's so different from country to country or in here in the States, we have the state rivalries, of course, but mm -hmm. you don't hate each other at the end of the game, but abroad, <laughs> that's not the same. I have a lot of friends that go to Purdue. I, I, I hate them for about two hours there while the game's happening. And then we're friends again.
<laughs> right, right. I loved how he also related it to the college sports landscape mm-hmm. as well, because that is so true. You know, P Purdue go IU has my been my saying since I was born, but still has a place in my heart. Still Indiana. <laughs> Yeah, there's there's no doubt about it. Uh, good conversation about the soccer world uh, with Steve Goff, who uh, works and has worked with the Washington Post since 1985. He is a veteran in the industry. Uh, we'll get Paul Shuey here. I see that he's joined. It says that his audio is not connected, so we're going to work on that here before uh, we get Paul Shuey on. Uh, but a lot going on tomorrow. I did want to get your thoughts on the MLB. You had a uh, you had a Cardinals team in St. Louis that was kind of amidst all the issues. Um, feels like the MLB might have a little bit of a better grasp on it now. Yeah, that's true. The Cubs, the Cardinals are going to play, I believe, starting a series on Friday. So, but again, we saw the A's had that issue as well. So amid the pandemic amid everything that's happening with hurricane even in our country and the social unrest there's just been so many things that are kind of preventing the MLB season to really be able to be what it needs to be uh 38 games have ne- games have now been postponed but on Saturday all 30 major league teams played on the same day for the first time since July 20 How about that how about that? There we go. Well, let's bring in a former MLB player. He was the number two overall draft pick in the 1992 MLB draft. Spent some time with the Indians, Dodgers, and Orioles. Paul Shuey joins us. Paul, how are you? Great. How are you doing? Awesome. Really appreciate you joining. Thanks uh, for being flexible with the date here. Um, let's talk about what we were just talking about here with the MLB and and the league's protocols right now i mean you were once in the league there for 15 years what do you think about how the league is handling this pandemic and and handling the safety of its players um i think they're doing as good a job as they can uh, i'm not a big uh i don't know i feel like the i guess the safest way for me to say it is i don't i wouldn't be wearing a mask if i didn't need to my instinct right away was like, give it to me and let's move on, you know, take it like the flu and just and roll on. I know it's dangerous and everything else, but I worry about my kids, everybody else, all the guys in the game, you know, having the mask on all the time, trying to play with a mask on just seems it's just it's just a little foreign to me and what I had to deal with. Um, I understand, but I don't necessarily uh agree with all the protocols well let's go back to your playing days let's start uh 1992 you finished up your really good career at at north carolina you're drafted number two overall kind of take us back to that moment if you remember those feelings you had on draft day uh what was going through your mind there as you're picked number two overall i remember um just being overly excited there was so much lead up I mean, every time you would pitch that uh, that final season at Carolina, it was like <laughs> all the guys were sitting there lining up the guns, and you're just – I don't know. I mean, I was feeling really good, so it was kind of, I don't know, show-off time, I guess, a little bit. You know, you're, you're just really trying to get the job done for your team, but at the same time, you know, show off the fastball, show off the breaking ball, and really – you know, I guess kind of improve draft position and, and, and try to help your team win. It was like a, you know, it was really fun. <laughs> I mean, I would assume being the number two pick being a really solid reliever would be very fun. What do you remember about those college days? I mean, you were a freshman all American in North Carolina. Did you, when did you kind of realize, okay, this is something that like, I want to do as a career. I can make it in the big leagues. Like when was kind of that big league moment for you? So realistically, I mean, I felt like that's what my path was going to be for a long time. When I was a kid, I think there was a one little brief stint where I read some books on detectives. I decided I wanted to be a detective and then went right from there to, uh, you know what? I, I throw the ball pretty hard and I like to hit and, I think I just, I'm going to be a baseball player. So that was early on, um, you know, it seemed like most of the teams my brother and I would be on, we were some of the better players and 
it just seemed like that was kind of where it was headed. And then when I left high school, let's see, I think I was maybe 6'1", 185. And then my freshman year in college, I was 6'3", 215, like in no time. They had that table that was like limitless, the amount of food. And and I, you know, indulged and got bigger and my fastball jumped big time. And it um, then the writing was kind of on the wall and then there was no doubt. It was actually hard for me to think about staying in school for three years because as a freshman, I was already, you know, throwing hard and you know, had some attention and I just wanted to get started, you know, with that track, you know, towards the big leagues. Transitioning a bit to your experience playing for your country. We've had a couple Olympians on to talk about what it's like to represent United States of America in comparison to normal competitions. You were on the U.S. team in the Pan American Games in 1991. So can you speak to what that experience was like representing your country? Well, first off, it was it was awesome. Um, just having those opportunities when I got that phone call, like, hey, we'd like you to come try out for, uh, you know, for the team in Millington, Tennessee. Um, and the catcher, Don Leshnock, was with me, too. And we uh, ran down there. And it was just uh, – it was a little surreal, I guess. You know, you're flying around. I mean, and it still sticks with me. I was – I uh, won't go into it too much, but I was telling some stories about when we played in Japan um, just the other night because there was some different culture gaps that you had to kind of jump as a as a kid coming out, and um, and we just had the best time, um, the guys, and but some of those experiences, shaking Castro's hand over there in Cuba, and you're just you know not sure what's going on. You're just kind of part of a crowd that's going in there and, and you're looking forward to competing and uh, you know you get a chance to compete against these other countries and it was just it was really special we beat cuba we took two out of three games in cuba in santiago and there was sixty thousand people and i still think that might be the most that i ever got a chance to play in front of and it was the kind of thing like we won and we're all celebrating and i'm like guys let's get out of here because <laughs> get out of here you know uh, and it it had been a, a a crazy we weren't used to playing with you know they were beating on the drums they had a I still remember there was like a i don't know he's probably like 80 year old guy that was fawning a big palm leaf over our dugout the whole time running back and forth and it was a crazy atmosphere and and really cool you know to kind of see what was going on but then it got real quiet when we won. And then it was like, you know, this is cool and all, but let's just see if we can get out of here. <laughs> and, uh, well, let's, let's talk about your your jump. You went from the collegiate ranks to minor league, then to the major leagues. What was kind of the difference or what did you notice, if anything, pitching to the major league bats versus some of the collegiate players and the minor league players? Was there like a big jump and a big adjustment period when you got to the majors? No question there was. Um, and it was, I mean, a lot of it was, was I know I know it's kind of strange to say, but size, you know, you see like a Frank Thomas, a Juan Gonzalez up close and they're monsters, you know, they're literally like trolls that came out from under a bridge with big monster bats. And it's just like, okay, all right, this is going to be different. And they're, they're just, huge guys and when they make contact the ball's just in the stratosphere you know so you learn um you know through college you had a few guys that you had to really worry about um i remember Derek hakopian coming out of maryland he was and he ended up playing with the indians but he was probably the best college hitter that i saw and um and then you get to that level and it's just totally different size strength um, consistency. Those guys could get in there and do it day in, day out. Um, you make a good pitch, maybe you don't get the call, and then you got to come in there with a the ball. And it's it's not a uh, uh, it's not a friendly time when you have to go ahead and come in with a, a fastball to somebody like a Frank Thomas. I remember the first spring training, uh, big league camp. I stepped in the, you know, on the pitcher's mound, kind of dug in, looked in for the sign, and it was Frank Thomas was the first guy I saw. And I stepped right off. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. You know, like, 
he's huge. You know, like that's it's just looked like this is a football player that's playing baseball and what's going on. And um, he ended up hitting a ball in a three, one count. I threw him my hardest fastball and he hit it right over Felix for head at shortstop. And I went right in and I was like, look, you know, I've never worn a cup, but I'm going to start wearing a cup guys. You know, this is, I didn't think I saw that ball off the bat. You know, <laughs> this is a, this is a different game that I'm entering right now. So in addition to that, do you have any games or moments that you remember from your career in the MLB specifically with some of the successful years with the Indians that you can recall and that just really stick out to you? Um, a couple moments, probably the first one that really sticks in my head was, um, we had a, a game against Detroit. I ended up getting four strikeouts in the game, but it was one of those where you were uh, just trying to get out of Dodge. You know, you're just trying to get the three guys out you need to get out. And I think I struck one out and he made it to first base. And I was walking people and it was just trying to get it over the plate, get strikes called, get those guys out. Um, and that was kind of a pretty good example of how I was uh, as a rookie coming in there. And then um, for me, the 98 playoffs was a big uh, a jump for me because I'd struggled in the playoffs in 96. And I think I started to settle down a little bit in those playoffs and just feel better, more comfortable. Um, Charlie Manuel had a lot to do with that. And, um, and I pitched well in that, in that series. I still remember the, uh, giving up a ground ball that I thought was going to give up like my first run in the playoffs that year. And I think Robbie Alomar touched it with a glove. Omar grabbed it with a hand and it was like two outs. And I'm like, <laughs> look at that, you know, all right. <laughs> the ball starts back there all the time, you know, let's let them play a little bit. Just make some decent pitches. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Just, you know, make some decent pitches and let these guys show off. Do you Trust your a- teammates. Yes, exactly. Do you have a strikeout that stands out to you like a Frank Thomas type of guy that you struck out? You're like, okay, I'm always going to remember that I got that guy to strike out on this pitch or something like that. Yeah. um, So I got bonds a couple times. Okay. And um, bonds at that time was, you know, he wasn't striking out and (laughs) Get him to strike out. It was like anytime you would strike him out, you basically got a standing O, you know, because it was L.A. and the Giants L.A. rivalry was real. And that was that was pretty good. And then you're talking about Frank Thomas. And of course, that pops back into my head because I remember a tight game in Chicago where uh, where there's two strikes. And uh, I think I was shaking the catcher off to get to the pitch I wanted. And Frank called time and didn't get it, but he stepped out of the box. And then I threw a fastball right down the middle that went in the game. And that was a nice punch out. And, you know, he's obviously all fired up and I'm just like, Oh, that worked out, you know, just threw a fastball right down the middle, but he wasn't in there. So it was perfect. <laughs> Have you seen the thing they did on Barry Bonds? I was just informed of this yesterday. They did a thing where if he went to the plate without a bat, and and the pitchers didn't know that the pitchers were just pitching their normal pitches. He would have still had like a 600 on base percentage if he just didn't have a bat. I mean, was he was he just a guy that you saw at the plate and you're like, okay, I'm okay walking this guy? No, no. Okay. <laughs> but you have to understand. So for me, he was a guy that I I always called him putting in the in a guy in a book, right? So if, if If I could strike a guy out, I could put him in the book, right? Mm -hmm. And Ray Boggs, I could never get him in the book. So that's still sitting out there, right? So even if it's like a old time league game, maybe I'll wait till he's like in a a rock or something, still go out and try to see if I can, hey, you know, grab a bat and see if I can get three by it. But um, Bonds is one that I was just dying to to get him because I knew how good he was. I think he still was probably the best hitter I saw. Um, And I'll tell a little story. about bonds that might help you kind of understand a little bit of what we're talking about. But we went to San Francisco and we're in the middle of the pitchers meeting and Jim Tracy was our manager and he broke into the meeting 
while we're talking about the guys. He's like, look, and he's like pulling his hair. We're not going to throw to Bonds. Not at all. We're not going to throw to him. We're just going to walk him every time. We're not going to let this guy beat us. And then he just walked out. And we're all kind of shell-shocked in the meeting like, what? That? Okay. You know, is all right, I guess we got our approach with Bonds. Okay, so let's move on to the other guys, you know. But we're kind of – obviously, <laughs> it was it was hard on a manager. And um, uh, the first inning, our starting pitcher, I'm trying to remember his name right now. He's left-hander. He struck out the first two guys, and then Bonds comes up. And Tracy's just pacing up and down in the dugout. And he's just like, go ahead, throw to him. And, I mean, first pitch. He just hit it right off the batter's eye, bomb. For, I mean, it was just like, and he was just pulling his hair out. And then I don't think we were allowed to throw to him anymore that whole time. That's kind of the – that's where you were with him. That's how good he was. He would come up to the plate, and he was either hitting a home run or, or, or you know, intentionally walking him. I mean – he was that dangerous, what he could do. Um, yeah. So now, having, having faced him, then where do you stand on the Barry Bonds, the the Sammy Sosa's in, in the Hall of Fame? Are these guys that should be let in even though they they cheated? At, at Were they that good that even if they hadn't cheated, you think they still would have had that presence at the plate? Personally, I think they should all just be let in. I mean, that's my personal feel. I mean – my whole career was, you know, built facing those guys. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I think there's even some guys in there that may have messed around with stuff, you know. So I think that the it's a real thin asterisk line, you know, as far as I'm concerned. And look at what's going on now. I mean, the game's changing, evolving. There's lots of different, you know, uh, ideas with it. And I just feel like those guys were the top of the game at the time. And they should be looked at that well, you know, that way. And um, that's just my feeling, you know. Yeah. But That's so, fair. <laughs> that's my opinion. I mean, a lot of those guys were just amazing. And to have to, to deal with a Mark McGuire when he's, you know, you make a mistake and it's <laughs> ricocheting off the upper tier of the scoreboard. Well, it was an awful lot of fun for the fans to watch. I know that. Well, you, you battled several injuries throughout your career, even all the way back to UNC and then throughout your MLB career. I mean, how, how difficult is it to stay motivated, to keep pushing yourself through the rehab, and, and kind of what helped you get through some of those injuries and getting back out to the field? Uh, I think the biggest thing for me is it was something that seemed to always have to deal with some. Um, and I was a very – team oriented guy so I constantly just wanted you know I always just felt bad you know because it was felt like the team needed me and I needed to rush back as fast as I could I think that's part of some of the issues I had later on in my career you know I've got a metal hip now from rushing back a little too soon um, instead of letting it uh, heal adequately um, but at the same time I was able to help the team you know by coming back soon so it's um, it was tough that way, but a lot of people I don't think have a real realistic view of how long that major league season is, how many games you're actually in. And as a reliever, we're getting up and down and up and down. And there's a lot of throws going on. Uh, I spent a lot more time, you know, my arm was one of the ones in spring training that didn't have a smiley face on the elbow. Uh, I didn't have, you know, uh, scars on my shoulder where the doctors had gone in and uh, it was because I threw my legs cool, you know, with my arm. And I think that helped for my, my upper half, but the, the lower half was, you know, a little bit of a Greek tragedy. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you so much for sharing all the incredible stories. You are truly a legend and we can say that, but Austin brought this to my attention and we cannot let you go without asking. We have to talk about bass fishing. Where did that passion stem from? When did you realize that was something you wanted to do post baseball? Well, I guess it started with uh, my grandpa when, uh, when he passed away. He left me his uh, 
his tackle box. And I was looking through the tackle box and I grabbed this crazy look orange polka dot at lure, threw it out in the pond that was near us and caught like a two and a half pound bass. And then that was kind of all she wrote because I didn't understand it. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know why. And I wanted to try all the lures out of the box then. And uh, so that kind of got me going. And then with baseball, um, a lot of guys who do a lot of different things on the road. Okay. And my deal was every city that I went to, I would go find a place where I could go fishing um, and have some peace and quiet, whether it was trout fishing um, on the Grand River in Toronto, or I think it was uh, a lady named Mariana in Seattle that had a, you know, a trout ponds in her backyard or whatever it was. I usually drag along like a Chad OJ or Travis Ryman or one of the guys and we would, um, and we just kind of make a little trip during the day and it's just a nice way to break up. And all you're thinking about is the fish and how to make a cast and, and doing that. And then it just seemed to be easier to handle the pressures that the, the baseball was giving you later on. And then when I got done playing, I mean, the, when you get done playing, that phone doesn't ring in the bullpen. You don't get that big adrenaline dump. And that's the biggest thing that I missed. And when you're fishing a tournament against a bunch of guys and racing at 70 miles per hour back and forth, and you catch, you know, like an eight pounder in the middle of the tournament, you get a little bit of a rush there. You get a little bit of rush after the Star, Star Spangled Banner in the morning and you take off and you just kind of miss that, you know? It's anything to kind of get a little bit of that adrenaline was good and that was a way to get some of it you know you can't get what you had but you can get a, a little bit of love from it you know well, i read somewhere that you call what what you're in the, com the competition level of bass fishing the double a bass fishing league i mean i i will be honest i'm not very familiar with the bass fishing circuit kind of explain to us what your competition has been like here since you've since you've joined well so i did it for i don't know maybe six years after, after I got out. And then um, basically climb the ranks where you do a lot of local tournaments and stuff, which I would consider a ball. And then you move up to like a double A where you're starting to really roll around the country. Um, fishing tournaments like Lake Champlain, Thousand Islands. And, and that's where you were getting into that double A, triple A, where you get to see some of those guys that are are so good on the elite level, on the FLW level, and uh, and get to compete against them. So that's where you got to see some of that, what I consider double A, triple A of it. But the next jump was going to be so, uh, like it wasn't going to be a family life going on with it. So I just got to kind of rein it back in and and kind of, <laughs> no, it's, it's okay to fish around here and do some tournaments once in a while and and chillax a little bit because I uh, I was getting a little too amped up. My garage still looks like I'm a little too amped up on it. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, we, we really appreciate you coming on, Paul. Thanks so much for your flexibility with the time. That was so great. Great storytelling. Um, really appreciate your time. No problem. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Thanks, Thank Paul. You. Take care. That was Paul Shuey, former number two overall draft pick of the 92 MLB draft. Also a, a former professional bass fisher, the double uh, A level, as he says, uh, spent some time with the Indians, Dodgers and Orioles. And, and we're what an episode tomorrow. I mean, that was two guys who are just fantastic storytellers. And I would, I would talk with, Paul about baseball forever. I mean, that guy's got some incredible stories. Just a great episode. Oh yeah. And both, of course, so many stories, so many experiences that they are able to share and just educate us on because that was a little bit before our time mm -hmm. when we were able to see them in action. But I mean, of course, they're still doing great things and they still have great legendary qualities to them. So Austin, thank you for bringing those guys on. That was just right. so much fun. Huge thanks to Dean Lanky for helping us connect with uh, a couple of guys that we may not have had on the pod without Dean. Uh, Dean's helping even when he's not here. Uh, that's just the man that Dean Lanky is. Uh, huge thanks to those guys. Uh, 
uh, who were supposed to be on last week. We had some technical issues both Monday and Friday, so we ended up combining them, having them come on here on this Monday episode. Uh, we'll be back to one guest starting Wednesday. Former U.S. – we'll keep the soccer theme going. Former U.S. men's national team player Alexi Lalas will join us on Wednesday uh, and then Kevin Bowen of 1070 The Fan in Indianapolis will join us on Friday to talk Pacers and, and the head coaching search as well as the Colts as they are. We're just about a week and a half, I think like 10 days away from opening night with Chiefs Texans NFL football. So uh, some fun stuff coming up here. Our podcast will not uh, tamper off by any means here as we head into the month of September. Tomorrow, I, I want to... Uh, it, it's not out yet, but I do want to plug your podcast that is coming. Tamar Cher will be starting a women in is women in sports podcast. Is that what it's going to be called? It is not going to be called that, but that okay. is the idea of That's it. So theme. I'm waiting to announce the name because okay. I want to get it settled. But I won't yes. jump to any conclusions. Email driven podcast Wednesdays at 2 p.m. We are very excited to have that coming here uh, through the IU Media School with with the great Tamar Share uh, leading the way with some of some incredible females in the sports world. So make sure you keep an eye for that on Wednesday. That's coming out. We'll be back on Wednesday uh, with Alexi Lalas as well, uh, joining us as we start the month of September and another month of podcasts here on Unpaid Interns. A reminder, you can watch on our YouTube page, on the IU Sports Media YouTube page, and you can listen wherever you get your podcast to our previous 42 episodes. Uh, again, thanks to uh, Paul Shuey and Steve Goff for joining us today for Tamar Share and those two incredible guests. I'm Austin Render saying so long from today's episode of Unpaid Intern.